Um, thank you everyone for joining. We're just gonna wait for the slides to load. Um, so, and if we just go into the view mode, that'll be great. So I, I titled this um, talk on reflections and notes on being a just leader in terms of using a social justice lens. Um, my details are there. You can find me on what is now called X. I still say Twitter, but we know what you mean. Um, my email is also there. People wanted to contact me later on. And just to say, I've had a history with the Council um, of Council of um, De Health, Council of Deans for Health, sorry. Um, for a while now, for a number of years, um, I have worked with supporting this 150 Leadership Program also uh, part of the anti-racist advisory group and, and I've done several other little pieces of things with Council of Dean so it's really wonderful to be invited to come and meet you all and give this lecture if we can have the next slide please so you're probably wondering you know um, who am I and, and, and what am I doing and why am I this person chosen to speak to you all well um, I just thought looking at me right now I wanted to say to you, I'm not the person that you see all the time. So there was a time I was much younger, and you can see I had lots of hair on my head. Um, I loved eating ice cream, so you, that, that's one of the photos on the, well, it's on my top right, um, me eating ice cream. Um, I was always adventurous, <clears throat> and I think that's why we learn about cultures and social justice when we venture into other people's culture. And my first trip outside of Europe was to Paris, um, so you can see me there at Tower Hill. Um, me as a student nurse in my uniform. And I think this the other photo is I went back home one year to visit my family in Trinidad. So that's just to give you a flavor. And when I speak today, you will hear me probably speaking from a nursing platform. And I draw from my experiences in healthcare and nursing. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so origins about me again I just wanted to really explain to you why I am here so I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago um last week Monday and Tuesday we had including Saturday and Sunday we had our carnival it's bigger than Brazil believe it or not um and Trinidad and Tobago is the birthplace of steel pan um and some of you who live in London or other places you may see um around Christmas time and Notting Hill carnival the steel pan or drums are being played uh, a really important part of that history is these were the drums or the steel pan that was used to transport oil um, because Trinidad is an oil nation and, and other goods. And so when people wanted to make an instrument and being a poor nation at the time, we really and truly cut the, 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 the metal drum as such into two halves and you have steel pan. And, and that's part of my heritage and music and the carnival. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> a few little things to tell you it's Trinidad and Tobago and Tobago has a, the most beautiful coral reefs and it's wonderful for scuba diving and it has the largest brain coral in the world and you can see that photo there um, if you went deep sea diving you'd see fishes of all sizes and colors we have stingrays turtles eels plant sponges in the waters of Tobago but each year, which is a really interesting thing, if you're ever in Tobago, um, it's that time of the year when you can go in the nighttime, when the moon is out and it's a really nice full moon and you're on the sandy seashore and we have almost 10,000 leatherback turtles that come to the shore to lay their eggs. And as we all know, this is a protected species and it's just wonderful to see how the leatherback turtle brings a community together as well because it's a community effort of how we try to protect them and what we do. So next slide, thank you. And the last little fact about where I come from is that um, we have what we call the pitch lake. Pitch is the, the term we use in the Caribbean, but what you would call probably in Western society is called asphalt. So it's what you tarmac and lay the roads with here. It is the largest commercial deposit of natural asphalt in the world held in Trinidad. And the amazing thing about this wonder, we call it a wonder, because it holds approximately 10 million tons of asphalt, is that you can go today and take out 5,000 tons. And tomorrow you go back, it just replenishes. No one understands or knows how the asphalt replenishes in the lake, but it just replenishes. So it's a never-ending um, lake as such of asphalt. 
and becomes part of our economy as well in Trinidad. So that was just to give you all a nice little flavor of who I am. And you could hear now probably from my accent that, you know, I am from the Caribbean. So we're going to move to the next slide. Thank you. So I've been asked to talk to you all because you're on your leadership program about just leadership or social justice. And what influenced me was my childhood. So that's why I was showing you those, those um, slides previously to sort of recapture for me in my head also of my childhood, what it was like growing up in Trinidad. So my childhood influenced my thoughts on social justice. To begin with, I grew up in a very poor family, the last of eight children. I went to school bare feet. Up until the age of, what, 11, I think, when you write your, I'm showing my age here, when you write that um, 11 plus examination to go into high school, I went to school bare feet. And I was really excited because I was now moving on to the secondary school and I was going to wear shoes for the first time. And it, it was wonderful, you know, I was really excited, but it wasn't today like where you take your children into the shop and they choose which shoes they want. My father just went, hey boy, come here, sit down. And I sat down and he took a piece of cardboard and he said, put your foot on that. And I placed my foot on it and he took a pencil and he drew my foot out, you know, the five toes that he says, then he took a scissors and he cut it and he went to the shop. He chose the shoe and he bought it. There was no fitting. That was it. That's, that's how it worked. But I was really excited and happy because I was going to have shoes for the first time. So it's really important, you know, how, you know, some of our experiences really and truly influence our thoughts on social justice. I come from a family of slave ancestry. And um, as part of that, when slavery was abolished, um, slave masters gave slaves a bit of land. So that, because that's all they knew to propagate land, cocoa and coffee estates. And um, so my parents got a bit of land, or I say my parents, you know, my four parents as such. Um, they got a bit of land. So I grew up on a cocoa and coffee plantation. Sounds nice. It's wonderful. Uh, the reality is the cocoa and coffee plantation was not within close proximity because the white man wasn't going to give the slave the best land. So that land where the plantation was is about, you know, 50 kilometers into the forest. That was the land you had. So my father had um two sort of, um they weren't donkeys, they were cattle. And he had made a slave for them. And that's how he transported the cocoa and coffee out of the plantation. And the image I had here for you is you could see that's what part of um, what a cocoa and coffee house looks like. And if you look closely into the image, you'd see the beans are drying. And you see it's on little wheels like what the trains are. Because we're in the Caribbean. We have rain. We have storms. And you're drying... Um, your cocoa and coffee to take to the mill. So if the rain was going to come as children, we will run and we will push it back under. It slips under the house as such and it's covered up. And then when the rain goes, we bring it back out because we have to dry it to sell it. Um, an important um, phrase I'm going to teach you here, just in terms of leadership, and you may hear it, people will tell you, why are you behaving? In the Caribbean, you'll hear this. They'll say, why well, you behave as though you have cocoa in the sun? And what that really and truly means as part of my growing up, it's an it, it's a saying that says, only when you have done something wrong, you're going to keep looking out to see what happens. Or if you've done something, see what the consequence is. So if there's someone says, why are you behaving as though you have cocoa in the sun? It's because when you have cocoa in the sun, you're always looking for the rain to make sure the rain doesn't come and wet the beans and spoil them. So it, you're always about your wits. So, th so that's a little saying we have. And also part of my thoughts around social justice and how I was informed is really and truly to tell you also about growing up gay in the Caribbean. Because in Trinidad, it is illegal to be gay. Uh, we're still contesting it currently in the high courts to have that overturned. So, so there are connotations of, you know, where social justice comes from for me. So if we move to the next slide, please. So here I have a few images. And some of you might know who some of these people are by looking at them and recognizing them. And some of you may not. And 
I deliberately looked for images of the younger people, of these people when they were younger, because I wanted you to see, as I said, you know, I feel like I'm an old man now. I'm no longer, I no longer have the hair on my head. So I wanted to see what people who I know today as some just leaders, what they looked like when they were young. So we're going to start from my top right, where it said, left, sorry, where it says justice and judgment lie often a world apart. And that is a statement made by Emmeline Pankhurst. Emmeline Pankhurst was a suffragette and she, one of, she was one of the most famous and influential suffragette leaders. Her embrace of protests and direct action around the early 1900s marked that new phase in the battle for women's votes and led to women getting the vote. So that's one of the just leaders. And if we come just under Emily Pankhurst, is a gentleman who I would never recognize as that younger person, okay? Um, that person is Mahatma Gandhi. And although you may have heard the name and you know a little bit about Gandhi, he's really and truly famous for working to achieve freedom and equality for all. He did this in India and in Africa. He's remembered for his creed around nonviolence and for his belief that black and white people should have equal rights and that they should be looked upon the same as every other person. That's that that those were the ethos of Gandhi. And, and if we go straight to the um top right, we have another gentleman. Um I had the opportunity to meet this person, but I say meet them, see them in real life. Um and that is someone who is known and loved. He's known and loved around the world for his commitment to peace negotiations and reconciliation. That is Mr. Nelson Mandela. He was South Africa's first democratically elected president. And note the word democratically elected. Mandela was an anti-apartheid revolutionary, a political leader, as well as a philanthropist with an abiding love for children. Underneath Mr. Mandela is someone who you may recognize, Dr. Martin Luther King. He is known for his contribution to the American civil rights movement in the 1960s. All of us know his most famous work is I Have a Dream speech. That was delivered in 1963, in which he spoke of his, of his dream of a United States that is void of segregation and racism. In the 1800s, it was considered unusual. Sorry, that, that, that was Martin Luther King, sorry. Um, I wanted to tell you about the next person. I left this person for last who is in the middle because I said to you all, I speak from a nursing platform. And this is Mary Seacole. Mary Seacole, and if anybody ever gets the opportunity to visit guys in St. Thomas's Hospital, you would see the wonderful statue we've erected of Mary Seacole there via the Mary Seacole Trust. But um, Mary Seacole really and truly um, was a very independent woman and she traveled a lot for her time, which was during the Crimean War in the 1800s. And she was very independent. She actually wrote, the book she wrote was called Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole in Many Lands. And this became later known as the first ever autobiography published by a free black woman in the British Empire. Note the word free, because at that time slavery still existed and you were you were the property of your owner, which was which would have been a white man. Okay, but she was a free black woman. Mary Seacole um, is known for her work in the Crimean War, where she nursed this. She had she had set up a shop, okay, and and she was selling goods and services, uh, I and pharmacological goods in that sense to help the soldiers who were wounded, and that's how she started her nursing career uh, and became known as a nurse. So I just wanted to give you, you know, these are some of the 
just leaders we know in society, some from years gone by, some more recent. And we're going to move to the next slide. Because what I really wanted to do is for you to begin to see what role models there are out there. And then what makes these leaders just? So what made Sekel, what made Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you know, all these other people, what made them Mandela, what Emily Pankhurst, what made them just leaders? It's because in their own space and time, they recognize how their own attitudes, beliefs, the view they had of the world, the history of their own life, how that influenced their approach and response to issues and people. And that's really and truly how you and I operate when we go into clinical practice. So I still practice in clinical nursing. Uh, I'm an intensive care trained nurse. And my beliefs, the, the whole thing, my attitude towards caring for someone or, or towards caring for a certain type of group, you know, or, or a, a group that identifies as different to the norm. My views about them influence their approach and response to issues and people. So my husband and I just came back um, a day or so ago from uh, Ghana. We were on holidays. And he said something, and, and he is white, and we have all these conversations about white fragility, and I tell him when he says something, I said, that comes over very racist. I know you don't mean it like that. But he made a comment. He said, why do people say black people smell? He says, because we were here, we are here in 36 degrees, and nobody smells. So why do we have that? That, that you know, that view. So he was kind of beginning to, 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 to break apart the view we have here in England. And we know we've heard it a lot when we work with our international colleagues, okay? So our own attitudes, our beliefs, our worldviews, they influence the approach and the type of healthcare leader you are going to become. The, the thing about these just leaders is they notice how language and communication styles are connected to culture and social identity. So there's something really important about language. And um, tomorrow I'm doing a webinar on, on language matters for um for maternity. Cause we're looking at um, as you all, those of you who know about Embrace, the report that talks about um black women who die um in childbirth um here in England. And we're looking at um we're talking, one of my um fellow students, we're talking about um inclusion in terms of having interpreters and how language matters when women are giving birth. So it's important to understand language and how people communicate. So I use my hands, you know, when I first started out in nursing, I qualified as a nurse in 1995. When we came to the end of the program, they told us specifically, do not use your hands when you go into the interview because you're a black man. And if it's a white woman interviewing you, she will think you're looking violent. And now I reflect on how racist was that statement and comment I was told. Because what the person with all good intentions was teaching me how to get a job, what they were telling me was actually all black men are seen as violent. So don't communicate with your hands, okay? Because they're going to think you're going to hit them. So it's really important to understand how people communicate and how that's connected to culture and social identities. When you're looking at being this just leader and what made those people we looked at just leaders is that they focus on strengths and positive attributes of individuals, communities and organizations. So there's something about valuing people, valuing those in our communities, those in our who are individuals in society, those who belong to certain organizations. We need to look at how we find that strength. And we also need, and, and those leaders, what they do is they recognize inequities from structural oppression, which have roots in the practice and policies of institutions. So I was recently approached by NHS England to do a developmental program for midwives from ethnic minority backgrounds to get from band five to six and six to seven, et cetera, et cetera. And my one 
So they sent me some of their feedback from a similar program that they ran. And the midwives had mentors in work or sponsors when they were on a developmental program for ethnic minority people. And when I read the feedback, most of the participants said, my sponsors, my mentors didn't know what to do. So one of the things I've included in this um, program is that I'm saying, well, most of the mentors or all of the mentors are white. So let's look at where the structural, you know, imbalance exists. So let's do a program for this group of mentors or sponsors alongside the developmental program for the ethnic minority staff. So they know how to support that person. And it was about building a relationship. How do we build relationships? Okay. So part of recognizing inequities will teach you how to build relationships and how those relationships lead to reversing those practices and policies in institutions that sit within, you know, oppressive um, rules. So just leaders, we support policy practice and system changes that affect disadvantaged groups. So we don't look at how we make the bankers richer. We don't look at how, you know, we will make non-doms not pay tax because they're not a disadvantaged group. We look at things around policy and practice that affect disadvantaged groups, okay? And in healthcare, you can begin to see how that unfolds. We advocate in sensitive ways and appropriate to the culture and subcultures of the people we serve. So there's something important about how we do that. I'm going to move to the next slide because I'm wary of the time we started. And Felix, I think we're going to have some questions and answers at the end. So I'll make sure I leave time. So just leaders tend to, what we tend to do as a just leader is you tend to move beyond the stereotypes of people to understand the difference that's within. You begin to look at the overlap among what I call identity groups here, as well as the constellation of the person's many identities. So another word for that lovely phrase, con constellation of a person's many identities is their intersectionalities. So we look at identity groups as well as their intersectionalities. So example, race, gender, class, income, age, sexual orientation, religion, ethnic origin, ability, socioeconomic, marital and immigration status. We look at all those sorts of things and how they interplay with each other if we're gonna become really just leaders in healthcare. And that's for your staff and for your patients. You really need to look at which groups and how, how they are identified. Um, you know, I see all these conversations taking place on social media around, you know, having um, transgender patients on female wards and, and all of this sort of stuff. And it's how do we move beyond the stereotype? Remember the stereotype I told you of? Don't use your hands as a black man when you're going to an interview. Because if it's a white woman who's interviewing, she'll think you're going to attack her. Well, that was a stereotype of black men that, you know, we are prone to physically abusing women. So it's the same thing here. How do you begin to break down those stereotypes and then look at the intersectionalities with it? So I want to just give you an example because you're all students. And those of you who belong to nursing, and you probably have it in, in the HCPC um, allied health professions as well, we have what we call fitness to practice. And it occurs for students as well, not just qualified staff. And I'll tell you this really quickly. I had a student who was going, who I was going to investigate for fitness to practice. The head of division for her department came to me and said, we don't want the student back. She's troublesome. Whatever you do, make sure you discontinue her. And I was like, ah, uh -uh, my brother, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, in my head, I just smiled when I, 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 you know, I listened to him. And he tried to influence. And when we got into the room, one of the feedback from 
the gentleman who does all the note taking, he said to me, you are the first person I've ever seen to do a fitness to practice investigation in such a humane and kind way. But when the student came in, I said to them, I said, tell me, where are you? Um, what's it like on the ward when you're there? Because she was always late on the ward. Okay, that's why they were bringing it to fitness to practice, punctuality. She's always late. And it just started in the last six months or a year. She was continuously late. And then I said, so when you get on the ward, what is it like, you know? And when you when you do arrive late, do you get a handover for some someone? How do you try to make up that time, et cetera? And then I moved the conversation along to say, like, so how was things at home? What's it like? You know, what's your typical morning routine like before you get to work? And then she shared. Her mother left her father and said, I've had enough. I'm going back home to where I come from. She is now left with four children under the age of 10, a grandmother and a father who works night duty. So she has to take the children to school, make the grandmother's breakfast, make sure the father has something when he comes home from his night duty shift. And that's why she was being late. But here was someone who didn't try to move beyond the stereotypes and understand difference. Because he told me, make sure she's discontinued and never comes back. Well, I tell you what, I sat at the graduation um, podium and I made sure I looked for her name. And she graduated and she may probably never remember me or recognize me because what I did was I said, hang on. We have a flexible working policy for students now at the university. Why aren't we doing that? She can start her shift flexibly late. She can start at 9 or 8.30 rather than 7.30, blah, blah, blah. And we can do this and she can have that. And I made sure a whole package was put in place for her. And she managed to qualify. And hopefully doing well now as a nurse. So it's really important that we move beyond stereotypes and, and, and that voice of other people in your head that tell you to do something you shouldn't. Um, so we're going to move to the next slide. I may skip some of these slides just because of the consciousness of time. And I do want to be able to interact with you all. So what is social justice leadership in the work that you and I will do in any healthcare setting? It is a practice of leadership that promotes equity of rights. And we are living in a really difficult period and time, okay, where our human rights and the rights of people are like shifting sands under our feet. So if you heard the news this morning, how many women are being investigated now for termination of pregnancies, okay? That same thing that happened in America, okay? Where they were looking at, at banning abortions and making them illegal, et cetera. It's arrived in the UK in a different way. So you need to be really careful. And that's what we talk about in one of my sites, I talk about reading and updating yourself. You know, our rights are being taken away. Patient rights are being taken away opportunities so it's a it's a when we look at social justice leadership it promotes the equity of rights opportunities access and participation everyone should be able to participate and have access to it should give voice and recognition within the organization and within that organization you work for it could be your ward your unit your area but for all who are in your team that's what it should matter it should look at structures and recognize them within and without or outside of the organization that causes marginalization. And to actively demolish and remove those structures and policies that may cause oppression within an organization. And our organization more or less is the NHS, okay? So we're gonna to move to the next slide. So some tips based on my experience and reflection being a social justice leader requires deep understanding of the issues at hand. And you don't have to say you're going to do everything, okay? You, you, you work like a scientist. If a scientist who is looking at the cause, let's say, for example, a geneticist looking at breast cancer, they strip that gene back and back and back until they find what they need to do. And you need to be that geneticist. You may have one area. So my areas of social justice, I cover its gender in terms of women's health, 
race, and sexual orientation. Those are my three areas. I'm not saying I neglect um disability and religion and all of those things. These are my areas of interest and that I've built up. So what I'm trying to say is you're going to have your area of interest and it will require a deep level of understanding of the issues. How you become empathetic, how you commit to driving positive change. For me, social justice leaders work towards creating an inclusive and equitable world where all individuals have equal opportunities and rights. So it is about the pursuit of fairness and equality in society. And it aims to address and rectify systemic issues that perpetuate discrimination, inequality, and injustice. So I'm going to move on and just give you a couple slides. I won't do all of them, but I'm sure we'll share them with you. To develop a social justice mindset, you need to look at how you cultivate empathy. And they must cultivate empathy to understand and experience, to understand the experiences and struggles of the communities, foster deep connection with others that we're serving. We need to stay informed, as I say, about various social justice issues. The historical context is really important. Acknowledge privilege. Acknowledge that, you know, being a man gives you privilege over a woman. Being, um, you know, white over somebody who is non-white, it, it, it's a privilege, yeah? So acknowledge those privileges and look at how you can use your privilege towards dismantling those oppressive systems. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so you should, you should have a clear vision and goals for what you want to do. Create a plan. Um, so, you know, I, I sat and I thought of how do we become more inclusive as part of social justice? And I wrote a plan and I first developed the Dame Elizabeth. I'm the founder of the Dame Elizabeth Anuwanyu um, Fellowship for Inclusivity in Nursing and Midwifery. Okay. Because I wanted to look at how we become more inclusive towards social injustice or social justice, rather. I also developed a series of lectures. Um, I was very concerned that, um, you know, where my activism part and collaboration and coalition building lay with the people I networked with so um, and the other leaders. So I was really concerned that when I go to a scientific conference, I don't see black and brown people pro presenting. I see mainly white presenters. So I approached the NIHR. I had a discussion with them. And now next week, we launched the first ever program of developing black and brown researchers in nursing and midwifery. So it's how you begin to strategically plan and see where your vision is going to take you. Next slide. <clears throat> so you promote diversity. I think we all know about how to do those things, um, but you create spaces that amplify the marginalized voices and perspectives. So it's about building an inclusive community. You ensure that everyone feels heard and valued and, and you, you challenge exclusionary practice and promote a culture of belonging. Um, so it's really important we look at those things. Next slide. <clears throat> so resilience, it, it, listen, there are lots of challenges. And I'm going to tell you all, it's hard work. It's not as easy as it sounds. You wouldn't believe how many doors are slammed in my face. You wouldn't believe how many letters come to the university saying, we would like to complain about Professor Calvin Morley because we think he's racist. That was the latest one I had. Well, that really shocked me. That really, you know, it shocked me a bit. Okay, Calvin Moly is racist, right? So there, you need to be resilient. You need to look how you become resistant in adversity and how do you use your allies to help you? And there's this thing about resilience. It's not about being strong, okay? It's looking at different ways of how we approach something when it comes to you and, and learn how to communicate the biggest part about communicating is listening. Sit in silence sometimes when other people are speaking. Don't feel you have to contribute. You can just nod and let them know that you're there. It's really important that listening becomes part of your, your skill. And then you can begin to look at how you use compassion to you know persuade people and bridge gaps and have those dialogues. Uh, next slide. I think I'm coming up to the last one, hopefully. <clears throat> um, so my concluding thoughts. Being a social justice leader, for me, 
Um, I think Brian is probably on the call, Brian Webster. Brian sent me a wonderful email asking me to do a podcast. And then, Brian, you asked me all these questions about leadership. And I was like, oh, my God, I didn't set out to study leadership. I didn't go and do a specific course. I naturally developed my leadership skills. And so when people ask me what type of leader I am and, and what type of leadership model I use, I'm just like, yeah, there's models and there's theories that 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 ground you. But when you're looking at being a leader, for me, it was a journey. And that journey really required my dedication to the cause. And when I say gender and women's health, it's because I have a mother and five sisters. That's why I look at, at feminism and feminist health. And it deals with a lot of self-reflection. And where your commitment lies to creating a positive change. If anyone looked at the um recent Netflix film with Banyard Ruskin, he says, you know, when people come at you, let's look at it in a different way. And I learned from that film. Because as I say, people like me who are putting their head above the parapet and saying, we don't have enough black and brown leaders. We don't have this. When I call out other organizations for using racist terms, they will come back, not immediately, but they will find a way to attack you. That's my lived experience, okay? So how do you embrace empathy? How do you foster inclusivity? How do you become strategically advocating for justice? Because these are the things for me that played a pivotal role in shaping where I have come as a social justice leader. Um, my journey towards social justice is ongoing. It hasn't ended. And each of us, including those of you in the school, you have a unique contribution to make. So together we can build a more inclusive and compassionate world for everybody.